Um, so today I'll be talking about um, in silico metabolomics, it's a, a new concept and it's uh, an approach to try and look at what we call the dark matter of the metabolome. And it's been mentioned, I think, perhaps once, uh, maybe by Kai um, or others earlier today, um, which is essentially the material that we can't identify. Um, and it's a term borrowed from cosmologists and um, astronomers about the, the matter in the universe that uh, we can't see, but we know is there. Um, so the... Um, I think I know there's a number of people who are probably new to metabolomics, and um, I, I know this is one of the first of, of uh, a small number of sessions that have been held at ISMB on metabolomics. Um, so I wanted to sort of give a bit of a background about the connection between metabolomics and the other things that most people uh, at ISMB talk about, which is proteomics and genomics. And so I've, I've illustrated this with this pyramid. Um, Xu Zhao had talked about sort of the inverted period pyramid with metabolome at the bottom. I put the genome at the bottom as sort of the base. Um, genes code for proteins, proteins manipulate metabolites. Um, and as you climb up this pyramid, um, there are increasing levels of, of influence by both environment and physiology. The genome is, is almost immutable. It doesn't really change with environment. It doesn't really change from physiology. The genome of the heart tissue is identical. The genome of, of uh, muscle tissue or of the stomach or the brain. But the metabolome uh, in heart or muscle or brain is very, very different. Um, same sort of thing is that with environment, what we eat or drink or breathe significantly influences our metabolome. Hopefully, it doesn't influence our genome. Uh, otherwise, we'd all be sort of mutant monsters. Um, so the metabolome kind of sits at that interface between the environment and the genome. So it makes it a really good tool for measuring the phenotype. Um, so in, in terms of metabolomics, again, many people in the audience are probably familiar with it, but others may be new to it. Um, the concept in metabolomics is somewhat similar to genomics and proteomics. We start with samples, tissues. Um, they could be plants, microbial, or animal tissues. Um, we extract them, not unlike what we would do with um, proteomics or, or, or genomics. And then in the end, we'll often work with some kind of biofluid, which is a little easier to look at. So rather than putting it through a sequencer, uh, we tend to put uh, those extracts into mass specs, which like we do in proteomics, we'll also put them into NMR spectrometers or other things called gas chromatography mass specs, or uh, sometimes we'll use infrared spectroscopy. These are the tools that are typically done to do chemical analysis, small molecules, as opposed to protein or DNA analysis. Now the approach to doing analysis of, of biofluids goes back almost 100 years. Uh, the instruments of NMR and mass spec have been around for 50 or 60 years. The revolution, as I think Jeff and Xu Zhao highlighted, has been in the last 10 or 15 years, which has been the development of, of data analytic tools that allow us to look at, rather than just one compound at a time, to look at hundreds or thousands of compounds at a time, to look at really complex mixtures and, and read out the chemical composition. So the data analysis is, is where a lot of the focus is, and this is why bioinformatics and cheminformatics play a crucial role in metabolomics today. At least in mass spectrometry, the, the standard way of identifying compounds is to collect um, a, a, a GC or LCMS chromatogram, either a total ion chromatogram or extracted ion chromatogram, uh, select a peak, in some kind, cases uh, in real time or in later time, look at the fragmentation patterns under those peaks. And typically, a single peak will have two, three, or even a dozen different compounds under it. Uh, the only way you can identify those unique compounds is by separating them by mass to charge or retention time or their fragment ion spectra. And what we're seeing here is some fragment ion spectra for the different uh, molecules hidden under that peak. And we compare them to databases. 
And again, people have talked about the database comparison problem of where we may have a mass and we may have a MS, MS, and we may even have retention time information. Um, but that comparison is, requires databases. Um, and the databases, uh, as have been mentioned, are, are relatively small. Uh, they don't, they aren't as large as GenBank, they aren't as large as Uniprot in terms of numbers of sequences. Uh, it's a few thousand to a few ten thousandths of, of, of mass spectra. But by matching the mass spectra, what you observe to um, the actual ones in the database, just like sequence matching, you can identify, in this case, your compounds. Uh, whereas in genomics and proteomics, we match to databases to identify proteins and genes. Um, now, metabolomics lags behind genomics and, and proteomics. Um, we do not get complete coverage, uh, whereas with genomics, it's standard to fully sequence all genes. With proteomics, we can typically identify about 10,000 proteins. With metabolomics, we're really happy if we can get maybe 150 to 300 compounds identified. Uh, there are two, two types of metabolomics. There's targeted metabolomics, and then there's untargeted metabolomics. The, untar the targeted approaches can use commercial kits. There are companies like Metabolon. Um, there are also in-house assays that people develop. And typically with targeted metabolomics, people get anywhere from 150 to about 1,000 compounds that they can identify and semi-quantify. Uh, that's only about a, a tiny fraction, about 1% to 2% of the known metabolome. Untargeted metabolomic techniques uh, identify many more features up on the order of about 10,000 features. And through things like mass matching, typically they can get, identify about um, 700 to 1,000 compounds tentatively identified and using more rigorous techniques that can maybe identify about 200 to 250 positive IDs. So whether you're looking at, at human biofluids, whether you're looking at cells and cell culture, water, soil for exposome studies, the, the same numbers keep on coming out is that we're typically identifying uh, between one and 5% of the peaks or the compounds that we know are there. So the coverage in metabolomics is still frustratingly low. Now, the reason for that is that uh, metabolomics is inherently difficult. Um, in the case of uh, genomics, we're just sequencing four bases. The chemistry for uh, base pairing and sequence uh, characterization is well known. And for many years, fluorescence-based sequencing was based on chemistry. Proteomics, again, we're dealing with polymers that just consist of 20 amino acids. The chemistry, um, the cleavage, the possibilities and alternatives are also uh, rather small when you only have 20 amino acids. In the world of, of chemicals, um, there's anywhere from two to five million biologically relevant chemicals. So the diversity, the chemical diversity that we have to deal with in metabolomics is hundreds to thousands of times more complex um, than it is for proteomics and genomics. And that's why metabolomics is difficult, and it's why where coverage is typically only uh, one to five percent. It's also another challenge um, in that um, the tendency for many people uh, is to, to turn to databases that are really not intended for metabolomics. So commonly preferred database is PubChem, which is a great resource, and ChemSpider, also a great resource. But these were designed to be chemical libraries um, of all known synthesized compounds that were ever assembled or written about. Um, we've done some analyses and of the compounds that are in these databases, less than 0.2% of them have actually ever left the lab. So that means if they've never left the lab, they're not gonna be found in you or an animal or a rat or a microbe or in the soil or in the environment. So um, that means that you, know, you can have up to a 99.8% false positive rate if you're trying to identify by mass matching to a, uh, just a simple chemical database. The other point that's been raised is that getting chemical references, authentic chemical references is both hard to do and expensive. Uh, if you go through standard sources uh, and you have about a million dollars, you can 
probably buy about 3,000 meaningful chemicals, uh, which then you can get um, and collect MS spectra. Um, there are routes to get more, and, and certainly Metlin has been able to do that and has made a valuable contribution in that regard. Um, however, overall, the experimental reference spectra, uh, the things that we need in these spectral libraries, just like in sequence databases and structure databases for proteomics and genomics, um, they're very rare. They're just not a lot of them. And what's more is that when even when we try and do our matches, even against super large databases like PubChem, most of the peaks that we see, most of the masses that we measure just don't match to anything. Nothing that's ever been synthesized, nothing that's ever been in isolated, nothing that's ever been purified over the last hundred years. So that's another problem is that most of those compounds, those unidentified compounds are not in any database. And that's why we call it the dark matter. So the current thinking um, in many areas of, of the metabolomics community is that um, we have a pretty good handle on the known compounds, compounds that are synthesized, compounds that are uh, in biochemical pathways, pa chemicals that are in natural products, chemicals in our foods, chemicals in cosmetics. There are ingredient lists. If you look at the side of a cereal box or any food container, the list of compounds is there. Um, human metabolism has been studied for 100 years. We have a pretty good idea of, of the, the main metabolites. But what happens to those starting compounds once they get inside our body whether it's a food or a cosmetic, a pollutant, or just the general metabolites that our body produces, they go through something called biotransformation or phase one, phase two uh, metabolism, or they'll go through chemotransformation, which is just sort of spontaneous reactions. Some of them could be oxidation or reduction reactions. Some could be photo-induced reactions. Many of them are caused by the microflora in our body. Some are um, also changed due to our liver enzymes. So we start with a whole bunch of things that we know, our body transforms them, and it produces this sort of green goop, which is a collection of mostly unknown compounds that are not in any database. So the current estimate right now is that the dark matter contains between two and five million compounds none of which are in PubChem, none of which are in ChemSpider, none of which are in HMDB, none of which are in Metabolites or um, any other database. So what can we do as a community? Um, we can either try, uh, as we did with the Human Genome Project, uh, which is to gather a lot of money and a lot of resources, try and collect all the known chemicals, buy them, um, collect all the known xenobiotics, the things that we found or are known to be food additives and foods, all the drugs, all the pollutants, all the cosmetic, all the high pro production volume chemicals. And then we can then process them through artificial guts and artificial livers, or we can hire organic chemists to synthesize variations of them. And so we can get this collection of two million compounds uh, by hook or by crook. Um, and then we can collect their LCMS and GCMS and NMR spectra. And then we'd have our huge library, which is what we need. Now, minimally, uh, if you were paying slave wages to people, um, you could get this whole thing done for about $2 billion. Probably a more realistic price would be about $20 billion. Uh, in these times, that's just not feasible. So it is unlikely that we will ever have the authentic compounds or the authentic spectra um, to characterize that dark matter. Um, the other approach is to try and do it computationally. And I would argue that that's more feasible, more reasonable, and it's also cheaper. And so that's what we've been doing. And, and we're not alone. There are others, obviously, um, that are starting to do this. So the concept for in silico metabolomics is outlined here. The first task is to try and collect all of the known compounds things that we know are absolutely sure are in either human systems or model organism systems or, or in the environment. Um, 
that I'll explain a little later, but we right now we have a collection of about 330,000 compounds that we're very confident can be identified and are confidently have provenance in terms of where they are in, in the human body. The next thing is to try and then do this biotransformation computationally, to run it through tools that predict the chemistry of phase one and phase two metabolism, to predict uh, microbial metabolism, predict promiscuous enzyme metabolism, predict spontaneous chemical reactions, all of which take place in, in organisms. And to predict those, and this is a tool I'll talk about called Biotransformer. And once we've been able to predict all of these biologically feasible structures, these things that are not in any database, the next step is to try and run it through some of the tools, some of which you've heard um, about. Um, but uh, our focus has been on, on a tool called CFMID, ID, which is to predict MSMS MS spectra. It also predicts GCMS spectra. We're working on tools to predict the NMR and the collisional cross-section. So we take these in silico structures and we create in silico spectra. Um, and then with these referential spectra, we can start looking uh, at our observed experimental data and do those, those database matches. So that's the concept behind in silico metabolomics. It's to create those libraries uh, using bioinformatics and cheminformatics. Over the last 10 or 15 years, we've been working pretty doggedly at creating databases of known compounds. Um, the Human Metabolome Database is an example, or HMDB, Drug Bank, collection of drug compounds. Organism-specific databases like the yeast metabolome or the E. coli metabolome. Uh, food databases and phytochemical databases and toxic exposure databases. I'll explain these a little bit. Um, the Human Metabolome Database, um, something that Jeff mentioned, the version one came out in 2008, I guess. And at that time, we had about 5,000 compounds. Uh, that's grown. Uh, we now know at least 114,000 compounds in the human metabolome. Uh, the database itself has lots of compounds. It has lots of pathways, um, lots of MS reference spectra, uh, GCMS, NMR spectra. The database is useful because it not only is sort of referential, but it contains lots of information about um, the enzymes that process things, the receptors and transporters, the SNPs and reactions, links to diseases, referential values in uh, blood and urine for, for biomarker analysis. Uh, lots of descriptions on, on their concentrations, lots of tools for performing searches and queries, and it's integrated into tools like metaboanalyst. We've developed other databases to help expand our knowledge of the microbiome, uh, E. coli being one, yeast being others, Pseudonomus, uh, another microbe that we've been building databases for. And we're in the process of generating several thousand uh, microbial databases like the ECMDB. Um, but the current one has about uh, 3,000 E. coli metabolites. These are linked to many reactions and, and genes and pathways, uh, as well as the referential spectra. Drug Bank um, is another database we've been working on to try and collect the, both known small molecule drugs, experimental drugs, um, again, links to their targets and enzymes, along with their referential spectra. So in a human being, um, you may find a person with a few drugs. If you look at a population, you'll typically find hundreds, if not thousands of different drugs in their system. And so drug bank also has become very useful in the field of both exposomics and metabolomics. Um, humans uh, have to eat other metabolomes. Um, and so in our effort to understand more about the human metabolome and more about the xenobiotics that show up in our body, we've been compiling constituents in foods, mostly raw or lightly prepared foods, uh, things like coffee or wine or beer, as well as um, fruits and vegetables. Right now, the database has more than 70,000 compounds and are covering almost 800 different foods. And it's structured very much like uh, HMDB and drug bank and ECMDB. In terms of trying to understand more about the toxic exposome or exposure compounds, we've been collecting data on 
pesticides and herbicides, um, solvents, pollutants, other things that show up generally at, at much lower levels, but are still findable and detectable in the body. So this database has tracked about 3,600 toxic compounds and also provides links to their protein targets and mechanisms of action. We've been extending some of this more to identify authentic biomarkers um, in a database called Exposome Explorer. It's looking at both diet markers and pollutant biomarkers and lots of detail on their concentrations and thresholds. So this is uh, a joint effort with the um, International Agency for Research on Cancer in Lyon, which is where the ISMB will be next year. Um, and this um, collaboration has also led to the identification of many compounds that are very useful for um, tracking exposures. The other thing that we see is, as mass spec becomes more sensitive is contaminants. And, and these are not necessarily toxic, but these are just things that we find in uh, detergent, in clothing, in rugs and carpets, um, in cosmetics and perfumes, in paints and surfactants. Um, and collect, right now we have about 55,000. We're hoping to get around 80,000 by the end of the summer. And these are compounds that just typically aren't in most databases, um, but they tend to show up in your mass spectra when you are collecting things on um, on biosamples. So I've, I've given you a quick rundown on some of the databases that we've been collecting and archiving and um, updating. Um, and together, there's about 330,000 compounds that we can provide provenance or source data that we are quite certain exist uh, in either humans or uh, in the environment that humans live in, or in most model organisms. So if we've got this set of known um, compounds, what can we predict? And this goes back to this pathway I was showing where we had um, known compounds from many different databases, their sources, source organisms. But the next step is predicting what happens to them once they hit the body, once they go into your stomach, or into a rat's stomach or into a fish's stomach, uh, what happens to them? And typically they get biotransformed. So the biotransformation is, is the fate for most molecules. Um, this is an example of a common drug, diazepam, and how it is biotransformed. In the liver, it's converted into multiple different metabolites. Uh, whereas in the gut, uh, it's opened up and several other metabolites are also produced. And these are microbial metabolites. So the top set are phase one metabolites, usually made it, mediated by cytochrome P450s or glucuronidases or different other uh, phase one, phase two enzymes. Now there's a variety of tools to predict biotransformations, but almost all of them are commercial and they actually have very tight restrictions on what you're allowed to do with those. So because of that, we developed our own tool, an open source, open access tool called Biotransformer. And this is uh, an effort of uh, Yannick um, who developed Classifier, which uh, Kai had mentioned. Yannick also developed uh, the bio Biotransformer tool. Um, it calculates the phase one and phase two biotransformations, gut transformations, environmental microbial transformations, promiscuous enzyme transformations. It has both a knowledge database that uses some machine learning as well. Um, and um, that collection of both heuristic and machine learning tools allows it to do quite well. Um, when we compared it to many commercial tools, it seemed to perform about 40% better um, and uh, often was uh, more accurate. This is an example of a compound which you'll typically find in things like apples and onions. It's called quercetin. It's a polyphenol. And when you eat an apple or have uh, onion rings, um, it gets transformed. It'll be transformed to a wide range of different compounds, um, some of which are shown here. Eventually, most polyphenols uh, are converted to something called hippuric acid, 
um, which we don't show here, but um, one of the precursors for it is, is also shown. These, so from one compound, it's possible to get up to 20 or more different metabolites. Some of them are known. Uh, some of the ones that I've illustrated here have not previously been detected. We evaluated biotransformer and, and we're looking at it for a bunch of different compounds. We looked at drugs, we looked at food compounds, we looked at pesticides, um, a, a range of other compounds, both primary and secondary metabolites. And we compared them to a commercial program called Meteor. Um, and we looked at things like precision and recall and, and uh, number of false positives and true positives. And generally, uh, we found that the precision and recall for biotransformer was about 10 to 20% better than the commercial one. Now, the commercial tools are generally very limited. They only perform phase one metabolism. So biotransformer is able to do the other types of metabolism as well, phase two, microbial, environmental, and promiscuous. We've converted biotransformer to a web service and it um, allows you to predict uh, sort of in a limited way, different reactions and products. Uh, depending on how much you ask it to do, it can take anywhere from five to 30 seconds. We've been running in the background biotransformer for the last few months um, to generate uh, from those known compounds um, that we have in our databases to the uh, unknown or dark matter. And right now uh, we've generated about 2.1 million compounds and we put them into a database called the Biotransformer Database or BTDB. It's very much in a beta version, so don't expect a lot. Um, but we wanted to make that available for some of our colleagues and for the community. What this has is now about 2.1 million compounds, 90%, uh, 99% of which are not in any database, all of which are biologically feasible, all of which have some provenance where we can either identify a specific enzyme or pathway or process that should lead to that kind of metabolite. Um, we have information on the structure, the names, the formula, the mass. Of course, we'd have very little information about uh, what these things are. They are really hypotheses, but the intent is that this now represents a likely collection of um, uh, molecules for what we would call the dark matter. Generating this database took thousands of CPU hours. We're regenerating it because we improved Biotransformer quite recently by using more machine learning techniques and those have boosted its performance by another 20% in terms of uh, sensitivity and specificity. We've added more complex biotransformation steps. We've corrected some errors. And then of course the database itself, we will try and improve it so it's a little more user-friendly and include all of the predicted MS spectra, um, retention indices and others in that resource. We've been testing it um, because uh, again, it was sort of a hypothesis, but we wanted to see if it would work in real, real life. Uh, we worked with collaborators in France where they looked at how uh, epicatechin, uh, which is a T metabolite, would be biotransformed in rats and mice, and they collected urine samples. And using Biotransformer, um, they're able to identify 22 known compounds, um, but that took about three months of literature search um, to verify those. And then the suggested 12 other novel metabolites, which they're trying to confirm now. So literally in about a 30 second run on Biotransformer, uh, they were able to get uh, something close to 35 metabolites identified, um, which subsequently required months to validate. But the point is that, that Biotransformer offers this opportunity to identify many unknown or hard to find compounds where they just simply don't exist in, in reference libraries. So Biotransformer uh, generates compounds and hypothetical structures. Um, but what we measure in metabolomics is not a compound structure. We measure a spectrum. We measure MS-MS spectra or GCMS spectra or NMR spectra or collisional cross-sectional area. So the idea is to take these synthetic uh, in silico compounds and generate observables 
um, in silico. And so this is what CFMID is about. That stands for Competitive Fragment Modeling uh, and Identification. It was developed by a graduate student um, who worked in my lab, uh, Felicity Allen, um, and she published this about five years ago. Um, we converted it to a, a web server um, and it allows people to um, take a compound and predict the spectrum. It allows you to take a spectrum and annotate an MS spectrum, all of the fragments, but it also allows you to take an MSNS spectrum of an unknown compound and to predict what the structure is. It's designed specifically for QTOF instruments. We're adapting it to work better for Orbitrap instruments. Um, it uses machine learning techniques, um, similar to the probabilistic graphical models or hidden Markov models um, that Pima uses. Um, and we found that as you train it more, it does better, uh, which is the nice thing about machine learning. Uh, when it first released, it, it did quite well in a number of tests, and we've been improving it steadily over the last few years. We've added more deep neural net tools into the fragment modeling. We've expanded the training set. Uh, we've improved both the chemical feature and topological representation to help with the fragmentation. Uh, there were problems in the early versions with ring cleavage. We've improved that. And then we've added rule-based schema uh, for compounds where machine learning doesn't do so well. So for lipids, acyl carnitines, acyl cholines, polyphenols, and a few other classes. So with those improvements, we've been able to um, enhance the performance of CFMAD for lipid spectra prediction. Uh, on the right is an example of a predicted and experimental spectrum, the blue and red. It's called a mirror diagram. So the stuff in blue on pointing up is the real spectrum. The stuff pointing down on red is the predicted spectrum. And we measure performance by uh, what's called a Jacquard score, the number of, of peaks that match. And you can see it's not perfect, but in terms of the peak positions, uh, it did quite well. We're comparing it to another tool called Lipid Blast, which predicts lipid spectra. Um, and using machine learning or rule-based methods, we can see a distinct improvement. Um, we've also developed um, other improvements with things like polyphenols and, and multi-aromatic structures. On the left side is the old version of CFMID, and we're measuring which is equivalent to the Jacquard score. It's called a DICE score. A uh, perfect score is one. So the old version, you're getting scores of 0.25 and 3.5. With the new version, um, matches and scores are up around 0.6 to 1. Um, we've compared CFMID uh, over the years. Uh, we have a version 2, a version 3, and a version 4. And the, these are the um, Jacquard scores, uh, or equivalent to DICE scores. And we're looking at different collision energies. So this is, these are MSMS spectra. So the early version, CFMID uh, 2.0, uh, did really poorly in lipids, um, moderately okay for um, um, the dice score in terms of electron volt collision energies, low, medium, and high. The newest version, uh, version four, which is hopefully gonna be coming out this summer, uh, some people are already using it, um, is performing about 20 to 30% uh, better uh, than the earlier versions. Uh, the rule-based methods also substantially improves the lipids. And then we've been using what's called the CASME data set, uh, which is a collection of about 200 compounds. And that's sort of a nice benchmark to assess performance. And we can see that each time we've improved CFMID, the number of compounds that we could confidently identify increased. So right now, CFMID is able to identify about 80% of the compounds. Uh, from that CASME data set. Um, and this is you know, using a, 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 a dummy set of about, uh, I think it was 40,000 compounds that uh, this, the compounds could be. So it's, it, it, it seems to work quite well and it's getting progressively better. And this suggests that um, in silico metabolomics um, is something that uh, could really help with the compound identification in, in, in that dark matter problem. We're not the only people doing this. Um, people are making use of CFMID. They're making use of biotransformer. 
And there are several publications that have appeared over the last few years where people have integrated the, the tools I've just mentioned in pipelines to do um, metabolite or natural product identification and to create a pipeline that makes the novel compound identification quite efficient and quite fast. Um, the one that was described on the right, they were able to identify an average of one completely novel compound uh, every two days, whereas typically it takes uh, two to three months if you work really hard, in some cases two to three years, um, if you're like the rest of us to identify and characterize a novel compound. So using in silico metabolomics, whether it was the case for analyzing T metabolites or identifying novel compounds in plant constructs or identifying natural products, um, really seems to work. So to wrap up, I just wanted to highlight a couple points. Uh, typically compound identification of unknown compounds is really, really hard. And we as a community tend to identify the known compounds, which only represents about one to 5% of the features. We're in a, a tough situation in the metabolomics community. We, we don't have sufficient MSMS um, spectra or compound libraries now or even in the foreseeable future. So the only route I think for now to get around that problem is to do in silico techniques, to come up with um, um, better or larger spectral libraries to create feasible biological compounds um, using what we know about chemistry and biochemistry. And that by using these predicted compound libraries, these predicted MS spectra, these predicted NMR spectra, a predicted collisional cross section, we can actually um, um, per perform identifications. I think these tools are improving year by year. Um, I think it's exciting to see what both machine learning and um, uh, careful chemical uh, inference helps and does to this. And I, I think I also wanted to emphasize that this is not a pipe dream. People are already doing this. They're using it. They're putting them into pipelines and they are working. So with that, I'd like to thank uh, my collaborators and the funders. Um, uh, I'd also like to thank uh, Jeff Shah, who was my uh, former PhD student, who's been doing fantastic work in, in developing his own sets of tools for metabolomics. Um, and I'd also like to thank the organizers and thank all of you for um, sticking with this and, and listening to the presentation. Thanks. Great. Thank you very much, Terry. So it's very enlightening. Um, there are a lot of questions. Uh, in both uh, Q&A box and in the panelist box. Uh, let me start with uh, the one in the Q&A box. So is uh, the biotransformer based only in human enzyme transformation or do you include microbial uh, functions, et cetera? So the microbial transformation includes many, many microbial um, groups or sets. Um, so these would be things that you'd find in the, in the gut um, it also includes microbial transformations that occur in soil um, as well, but in some respects, those also align with what we find in the gut. So it's quite diverse. Um, and we are trying to work or add um, some of the cytochrome P450 transformations that we would typically see in plants and some of the glycosylation um, processes that are also seen in plants, but that'll be a, a different version of biotransformer. So uh, Cecilia Neutcher is asking, are you planning to expand food DB to include more cooked and processed foods? I guess she doesn't like raw food. <laughs> yeah, so um, it's a very difficult thing to do. There is there is um, data already at the USDA for many of the processed foods um, for limited numbers of compounds. Our view is that we wanted to try and capture um, most cooked and processed foods start with raw foods. And so there are some transformations that happen with cooking. Um, and obviously if you make you know, lasagna, you've got tomatoes and pasta and there's many other ingredients. In principle, you would have all of the uh, components in food DB for the recipe for lasagna. So you could assemble that um, from the recipe, the likely constituents uh, for lasagna. 
And so that's our perspective on trying to um, include prepared foods. The cooking um, is, is, a, is a difficult thing to predict what's happened with them and uh, to, to collect the data is, is really, really difficult. So there are a couple questions uh, on the same theme. Uh, what's the difference is between the biotransform database versus uh, other compound ID databases and the database from Argo National Lab and other tools like uh, Magma, et cetera? So the biotransformer database um, is a collection of predicted compounds, all of which are biologically feasible. Um, probably these are None of them are compounds you will find in databases like PubChem. You won't find them in Argon Lab. You won't find them in, in any other database. So they are unique, distinct, and biologically feasible. Not necessarily all correct. So they're essentially tools to test or assess. And they all have some provenance, meaning that they tell you which was the starting compound and what were the enzymes or pathways that led to it. So it's not just sort of a random collection of, of uh, machine learned chemical structure generator. It's, it's one where it's actually computed the likelihood and um, enzymatic provenance of those compounds. Um, the database itself still doesn't have referential spectra. Um, that takes many, many CPU months of calculation. So we're running that now. And as I said, version two of the database will have that, that referential data. So the idea is that you would use it similar to the human metabolome database or Metlin, except it would be a collection of compounds that uh, is all in silico. Lorenzo Calvello wants to know if you can use predicted by transformation to search for compounds that are likely to interact with the protein complexes and the nuclear nucleotide acids. So um, people are already starting to use some of these biotransformed compounds to start um, screening, um, doing QSAR work, um, ligand docking work. Um, Again, that might help people suggest bioactivities for certain compounds. Certainly people working in the field of natural products and, and foods are really interested in this because um, most food uh, metabolites or micronutrients are, are heavily transformed. And although many of you hear about the polyphenols and the antioxidant activity, um, most people in the field of polyphenol research now realize that the health effects from polyphenols come from the biotransformed metabolites, not from the polyphenols themselves. So uh, there is a question that really deserves people's sympathy. So uh, the question is, I have metabolite from Metabolome Inc. without any IDs. So how, I, how can I use them if I do not have any identification or pathways? Uh, uh, I don't know how that come about. I guess the person received some uh, data from a commercial vendor and the, some of the data do not come with the identifiers. Yeah, so Metabolon typically will provide a list of compounds that it formally identified, and then it'll have compounds which um, it sees consistently, but it doesn't have formal identifications on them. Um, you can also, I think, if you get the really cheap Metabolon analysis, I guess they just give you the list of, of uh, identifiers, but no, um, no metabolites. So the trick is, you know, pay them more money uh, and they'll give you more information. Um, the um, alternative is um, if you have um, the mass to charge information that they've released, then it is possible to search through various databases to see if you can get a match. But at least if you're getting, purchasing or acquiring data from Metabolon, um, the only way you could get more information is to pay them more money. Uh, another question is that I'm still confused what is the input for your algorithm to identify novel metabolites? So we take the structures of our known compounds from our databases like HMDB and DrugBank 
um, and uh, expose them, explore, and food DB. So there's about 330,000 uh, structures. And these are in mobile files or SDF files or smiles. And we feed those mole files or SDF files, those electronic files into Biotransformer. Biotransformer looks at the structures, um, makes predictions on which bonds of metabolism, sites of metabolism will happen, where the metabolic reactions will occur. It runs through hundreds and hundreds of different possibilities, uh, it has a knowledge base that it looks through, it has uh, machine learning tools. And from there, it, it generates a whole bunch of, again, mole files, smile strings, um, in this case, about 2.1 million. So it's electronic data that goes in and electronic data that comes out, and they are structures, uh, electronic structures. Well, the last question here is tricky. Did you ask for NIH funding to identify and metabolize? <laughs> so we are part of an NIH common fund um, project uh, working with um, uh, Tom Metz and PNNL um, that's focused on exactly this in silico metabolomics. And uh, they are working actively in the area of uh, collisional cross-section prediction uh, with a tool called Dark Chem. And my group is working actively in the mass spectral prediction. And the idea is to merge both uh, the CCS predictions with MSMS predictions to help identify novel metabolites using this in silico approach. Uh, let me add to that, actually. I put the information uh, on the Metabolo Metabolomic Consortium from NIH in my talk. So the link is metabolomics.info. Uh, actually, NIH uh, recognizes that uh, metabolite identification is uh, the most urgent task in the field. So they actually funded five uh, centers working on compound identification. So at uh, metabolomics.info, you can find, find information on the projects. Uh, people can also find other uh, educational resources and funding opportunities.